war ends, the slaves are free, but peace and justice are still a long way away. It's the period of reconstruction, and one controversial man is at the center on a mission to preserve freedom in the South. From a law enforcement perspective, one might consider it the first war on terror. The Civil War is full of famous faces, heroes like Lincoln, villains like Booth. But chances are you wouldn't recognize Hiram C. Whitley. It's not quite clear whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. That's for you to decide. Some of the information I found was really intriguing. He had an extraordinary life story, and I thought, wow, this is the most interesting American I've never heard of before. And Charles Lane is an editorial writer for the Washington Post. He investigated Whitley's story for his book, Freedom's Detective. Whitley's the second chief of the Secret Service with a heroic record as a Union spy, but also a dark backstory. Hiram C. Whitley was uh, kind of an adventurer. He was somebody who was very self-made. He ran away from home when he was 16, did a lot of sketchy things in business. He had a talent for deception and fraud. He was extremely brave. He had nerves of steel. And he used that for sort of good and for ill. Hiram Whitley marries into a staunch abolitionist family from an anti-slavery church in Massachusetts. But in Kansas, he betrays them by using his contacts in the slave community to help bounty hunters ambush people on the Underground Railroad. He's arrested, but flips on his fellow kidnappers and flees Kansas for New Orleans, where he sells sugar and molasses. He meets General Benjamin Butler and offers to work as a spy for the Union. But considering Hiram Whitley's reputation, could he be trusted? Sometimes evil people do good things and sometimes good people do evil things. Whitley's spy mission, take down a newly formed terrorist group. In the years following the Civil War, the Ku Klux Klan emerges in 1865 as a club for Confederate veterans in Tennessee. As civil rights became federal law and started to affect the South, it mutated into a secret terrorist movement to resist the new order in the South. And between 1866 and 1868 sort of morphed into this evil conspiracy that was quite widespread and built through the infrastructure of the former Confederate Army all through the Southeast. But what they were a little weak about was the ultimate uh, means. You really would have to go all the way out to war to really defeat them. And so they tried to come up with things short of war that would defeat the Klan. The Klan isn't just going after African Americans, but also white Republicans. In 1868, the Klan carries out its first true political assassination. A white Republican leader in Columbus, Georgia, named George Ashburn. Whitley, who was one of the few sort of federal agents on the shelf at the time, so to speak, was brought in. And using his, for the time, very unorthodox and innovative methods, he was able to solve that case and to infiltrate the Klan and get testimony from Klan members and identify all the killers. And that sort of made his reputation so that when Ulysses S. Grant became president in 1869, there were a lot of Republicans in the government who knew Whitley and they selected him for the Secret Service. Defeating the KKK is especially difficult as the Klan has support from many, if not most, white people in the community. It was almost impossible to get anyone to testify. There were no forensics or DNA or anything like that, even very few photographs to use as evidence at the time. You needed testimony from inside the conspiracy. And that meant you would have to overcome the code of silence, you would have to overcome the witness intimidation that silenced everyone who knew about the plot. Whitley's plan, take the Klan out of their communities to an army fort off the coast of Georgia. The Klan has no control here. And they took all these people who were witnesses or suspects out there 
and Mr. Whitley proceeded to interrogate them with nobody to watch and no lawyers. The South is outraged. Would the United States be one big nation across the whole continent, or was it going to fall back into the old divisions and the idea of states' rights and not be a unified nation state? President Grant is fed up and sends federal troops and a band of spies to the South. The news from the South had gotten so dire about Klan violence that both the Republican Congress and President Grant said, OK, we need new legal authority, troops, and we need secret agents to go into the South and really root this thing out. The whole idea of detectives and a secret agency under the control of the federal government was radical in the 19th century. And people, including many people who were opposed to the Klan, had misgivings about the idea of the government sort of sending spies into the civilian population. Whitley is the spy master. He uses new techniques like photography to professionalize the Secret Service. He used all the expertise, all the tricks of the trade, all the disguises, all the cover stories, all the knowledge that he had um, about how to infiltrate criminal organizations. Although convictions are rare, the arrests and Whitley's psychological warfare demoralizes the Klan and forces it to retreat. And he does it all with just 12 agents in the South. In 1905, a novel called The Klansman is published. Which basically told the story of Reconstruction from a pro-Klan point of view. It's a very ugly piece of propaganda, very racist, and even in its own time, very controversial. A decade later, it inspires the racist film Birth of a Nation. But in between the novel and film, a stage performance called The Klansman sells out in cities across America, including the Opera House in Emporia, Kansas. The owner, Hiram Whitley. The man who once battled the Klan is hosting the theatrical performance of The Klansman, but he's quoted in a local newspaper stating the play glorifying the Klan is a distortion. He says the Klan is evil. I kind of admired that because I thought here was a guy who in a time when that wasn't necessarily the most popular thing to say, he took a side and he resisted that attempt to whitewash the Klan. So that gets back to an earlier question that I will ask again at this point of the story. Do you feel like he has evolved or we're still not sure? Well, again, <laughs> he did let the play go on. And I was just going to say, it was his theater, right? It, he did make money off it. So yes, there's always an ambiguity involving Hiram C. Whitley's motives. Was he morally bankrupt, or was he just an opportunist? I think he had a capability to do great evil. At certain points in his career, he used methods of interrogation that we would consider torture today. On the other hand, he could have a conscience. I think it's good to bring back to our consciousness the fact that the Secret Service wasn't always just a bunch of guys with earpieces standing around the president, that it had this really daring quality to it in its early days, and that it had this really remarkable, original, and important, and I think just mission at its origins. Ambiguity, deception, not the traits of a good neighbor, but essential to being a good spy. Perhaps Hiram Whitley is the right man at the right time to keep the South from tearing the country apart once again.